Hey, this is YBR, and today we're going to be taking a look at some of the articles that were released before Cyberpunk 2077 came out and the 48 minute gameplay trailer, and we're going to see how that compares to the final version of the game. And the source for these articles will be listed in the video description. So the first article said there will be over 1,000 NPCs, all of which will have their own handmade daily routines. So what does it actually mean? Well, there are a handful of NPCs that do their own unique thing, like this guy here who's just standing around all day talking about the Arasaka and how much he hates them. And throughout the day, he will roam around the street talking to different people at different locations, but that appears to be as deep as it goes. That's just a basic NPC for an RPG game. But they made it sound like there'd be so much more to the NPCs. I expect it to be more like he's here 8 hours of the day and the other 16 hours he's at home with his family. And maybe he even has a walking path that gets to a specific building that's considered his home. But I've skipped ahead 12 hours. It could be midnight, it could be noon, it doesn't matter. He's just going to walk around and talk. Annoyingly, when you skip time, their locations don't change. So you skip 12 hours and they're still here 12 hours later. Compared to Fallout, if you skip 12 hours, they will have simulated what the character would do in that 12 hour period and they'll be somewhere completely different after the time skip. They said there would be over a thousand NPCs. Let me show you how easy it is to get to that number. So you got about five dudes there, two dudes there, and another three dudes there. All they do is stand in that specific location and then if you get too close to them, they will shoot you. They'll also chase you a little bit if you commit a crime near them like I'm about to do to this guy. It's funny. When I went to record this clip, I found something dumb about the AI. If you get too close to the enemies on one side of the road, then run to the other side, you can hide behind them and they will do absolutely nothing. These are all Arasaka agents, so you'd think they'd work together to capture me or they would do something about the fact that they're being shot at, but they just don't care. There are a lot of small dumb things about the AI, just like this throughout the whole game. That's going to cover the advanced NPCs. There's also the more basic NPC, they're the ones that have no logo above their head and they just kind of walk around. As for the NPCs that are walking around, they don't seem like they're going anywhere in particular. For example, sometimes you'll have two of them that crash into each other, they don't say or do anything, and instead of walking around the person, they just spin around and go back the way they came. Now we're going to test how the NPCs react to my actions. For example, if I shoot the gun at the ground, what do they do? The majority of them will just run away, but a couple of them crouch down, so there is a little bit of variety to what they do. But one dumb thing I've had happen is you go into a building because you're raiding it, killing the people inside. You come outside, and right outside the door, you have a dozen people all just crouching like this instead of, you know, walking away from the gunshots. Now, we're going to test the AI reactions when they're inside of a car. So we're just going to go ahead and toss an EMP grenade like so. And the AI's reaction here is a lot less varied. Every single one jumps out of their car in the middle of the freeway and crouches down on the floor. Unlike other games like Grand Theft Auto, a normal NPC will never confront you for your actions. They just cower or run away depending on the situation. The only ones that'll fight back are the ones that have the yellow icon above their head. And what makes them fight back doesn't always make sense. For example, they have some police here doing just some normal police investigation. I look at them for more than 10 seconds. They start trying to murder me. Thankfully, these NPCs are stupid and they can't drive a vehicle. They don't start inside of a vehicle. They can't enter a vehicle. All they can do is chase you on foot. That's probably a good thing because the driving AI is really bad and this corner is a great example of that. The car in front just forgets how to go around the corner and stops right there. So what do all the cars behind them do? They just stop behind them. They make no attempt to go around them. Even if this was a multi-lane highway, they would make no attempt to go around the car in front of them. So next up, the game promised a wanted system with corrupt police as well as powerful NPCs who can come after the player. So here's how the wanted system works. You see these cops? I go ahead and murder a few of them. I hop into this car, and by the way, the cars that are in front of them have magically disappeared. So we hop into this car and we're gonna drive a few blocks down the road. That is all it will take for the cops to completely forget about me. And as for the corrupt cops, I have no idea what they're talking about unless it's they don't care that I committed a crime anymore because they're that corrupt. If I go over to that exact same location, even standing right over the cop that I murdered, they have completely lost interest in me. These are the exact same cops that were shooting at me just 30 seconds ago. The way the cops react is supposed to be different depending on your location. Here's a direct quote. In Pacifica, one of the poorer areas, you could probably shoot someone, and if nobody would see, then nobody would care. If you would do that in the city center, you'd probably get some law enforcement. So here we are in Pacifica. 
there's a person standing here and there's absolutely no one else around. So we're just gonna go ahead and just do a real silent whack with the bat. Just like that, crime reported, police warrant issued. Nobody saw me commit that crime, but there's a cop right there. By the way, that's how the police spawning system works. You look behind you, there's nobody there. You spin around, there's a cop there. That's amazing police AI. Oh, now there's a cop on this side. But once you defeat them, what's that behind you? More cops. And it really feels like there's no actual point in fighting the cops because you can just run away so easily. And you don't gotta run away far. I go up on the roof, they're not gonna follow me up here and I'm basically safe and all I gotta do is wait long enough and eventually the cops will have given up even though they literally have me cornered on the top of a building. It's not like it's a secret I'm up here. I literally just walked up the stairs. And I think possibly the most well-known quote there is came out just a few days before the game was released. And that quote was the game runs surprisingly well on current generation consoles. It didn't. I don't have any footage from the consoles, but I've seen a lot of people saying if you have a basic PlayStation 4 or a basic Xbox One, it is going to struggle with this game. That's going to do it for the text-based articles and just for fun. How about a feature that's listed in the introduction to the game, but not actually present in the final version? The stash. It technically works, but it does not deliver on the features it says. So let me just read this whole thing to you. Your stash is a secure system for storing equipment and can be accessed from all of your available safe houses and vehicles. For example, if you store something in your car trunk, you'll be able to access it from your apartment later. First off, the safe houses. I really wonder how many they originally planned when they wrote that line. So here's the real problem with this though. It says that the stashes will sync up, right? So let's go ahead and test that. Here we have two of my vehicles. If we go over to this one and open up the stash, you will see that it is empty even though I have many, many things in my stash at the apartment. Then if we were to go ahead and just drop some things into here and then look at the stash on the bike, you'll see that nothing is shown on the bike. And if we try to add things to the stash on the bike, it doesn't work. It won't let you add anything to it. So the stashes are very, very much glitched up. Thankfully, I don't think you'll lose anything from the glitched stashes. It's just, it'll be a pain to access it properly. This isn't exactly a removed feature, but I feel like they're foreshadowing something that never really takes place. In the intro, when you're driving with Jackie, there's a scene where Max Tech comes out and they completely wreck the criminals that are there. Jackie and V basically said, hey, you don't want to mess with them. They are way strong. And you know what? That's exactly what they did because there was never any references to them outside of just this. The only place that I've seen Max Tech is when you get the four star wanted level and they come out as the super police. But I was really hoping there would eventually be an actual mission where you get to fight Max Tech and try to beat them. They never came up in the main storyline or any of the side missions that I did. Although admittedly, I still have a lot of them that I have yet to complete. It's pretty much the exact same story with the trauma team shown in the intro. You will sometimes see them on the side of the road with an injured person, but you can't have any meaningful interaction with them. My fingers are crossed that eventually I'll find some side missions that have direct interactions with both Max Tech and the trauma team. And kind of related, brain dancing is a mess because they have a specific scene where Judy gives you a brain dance headset, but it's completely pointless because you can't actually use the brain dances that you can go and buy. It really feels like half of brain dancing stuff was just scrapped at the last moment. Honestly, I wouldn't be surprised if they removed most of the brain dancing features and just left in the ones that were absolutely essential to advance the quest because from what I read online, most people don't like brain dancing. There's some other features that the developers originally said would be in the game, but then they said they had to remove them. Most notably was the subway system. Originally, you were going to actually get to ride the subway and see the city, but instead we have a click to teleport to your destination. Keep in mind that what you see here is not final. We just want to give you a glimpse of what will be possible in the released game. So there's no reason what we see here shouldn't be possible in the released version of the game, right? So the first thing we're showing in the trailer is the character creation. The version that is shown in the trailer has a lot more options for the backstory. We have three separate categories that each have three options each. So that means there'd be 27 different possible combinations. And these choices feel a lot more like a character backstory. This is your individual person. In the finalized version of the game, we have one thing to choose and three options in it. 
this really doesn't feel like your own character with their own unique backstory. It feels more like you're choosing a character to play. And then also the choice here really doesn't seem to matter that much. Because the first 15 minutes or so of the game are completely different, then it basically becomes the exact same game. There are some alternative dialogue options in the mainline story depending on your background. For the most part though, you feel like you have the options of yes, rude yes, and yee-haw, I'm a nomad yes. Now I have read online that there are some quests that are specific to your background. Unfortunately, I have been unable to find a list of what quests those are, so I don't know if I did any quests that were unique to the background I chose or if they were just all generic quests. I really hope this is true because I don't see myself playing the game through again just for the different dialogue options, but I might do it for background specific quests. Really what I expected out of this is if you pick the corporal version of V, you get to play the game as the corporal version of V. Instead, you just get to be Corporal V for the prologue. After that, you feel like generic V. Basically, I want it to be the background you choose is actually really important. Then, I would play the game as a different character because I know I would get a different experience that makes it worth it. In reality, there's probably only a couple of hours of unique content related to your character's background. And a lot of the dialogue in the game really feels like it's based on the idea that you're probably going to be the street kid version of V, which makes sense because if you look at the V character shown in media, they look like they would be a street kid. They definitely don't look like a corpo and they really don't look like a nomad either. I want to say they added the option for the character backstory to make it feel like character customization is more than just visuals. But honestly, I feel like that's a detriment to the game because if they just chose one for you, they could have had a more focused idea on who V actually is. And then they could have worked that one single backstory more into the game because for me personally, I would prefer a main storyline that is based around just one single background that was more deeply connected to my character instead of having the choice and then having some side content related to that choice. That really is just personal preference though. I'm sure some people out there have the exact opposite opinion on this matter. Now back to the preview on the character creator. I think this version has a much better interface than the final version. And at first I thought, well maybe that's because they made a PC version and they had to change it up to make it work with the consoles. And then I noticed this version actually has the buttons for a controller listed on it. So I'm assuming it would have worked perfectly fine with the controller. And I think this one's better because it has separate categories for each part of the person. So you have face, hair, scars, and other. And then it also tells you what number you are. So you're on eyes 4 out of 10, for example. On the finalized version, you can customize your character a lot more though. Because not only are there more things you can choose to customize, you also have more options for each customization. So we only had 10 options on everything it seemed like in the preview, but on eyes for example, we have 21 options. The only thing that sucks is you want to know how many options there are, you got to click to go in reverse and then you say, oh, we have 39 options for hair. Why they couldn't just keep the number there to tell you how many there are, I will never know. But you also see here, it's just this really, really long list that you just have to scroll through. And it's just kind of dumb. It's like, oh wait, I want to change something way up here, now back down here. And it's like trying to find the one thing you want to change is a bit of a pain. Because it's not like you're going to memorize the locations of things. You're going to look at this once, and then you're going to be done. Which brings me to one complaint I have about the game that's really, really big. You can't change your character after you make them. And it doesn't worry you about that anywhere here. I just put a random character and I said I could always change them up later, basically. And little did I know, you couldn't. They just need a big fat warning somewhere that just says, hey, by the way, you can't change anything else about the character now. Which also doesn't really make that much sense considering this is cyberpunk where you can get augmentations, implantations, you could do whatever the heck you want to make your character look crazy in the world's lore. Yet in the actual game, you can't change it at all. And then also on the preview for the character creator, there's an option to choose your clothes. It just kind of sucks that you don't have that option anymore. The last thing I'm going to mention about character creation is on the stats, originally there were six different categories, but on the final version, strength and constitution have been merged into body, which actually makes a lot of sense because if you played Cyberpunk 2020, the tabletop game, you would know there is no strength and constitution. You just have a single value called body. And you can also see a remnant of this in the character menu here because it's laid out like there'd be six different things you can upgrade, but the very bottom just blurs itself out and you can't actually interact with it in any meaningful way. Now we get to see the real gameplay from the trailer. They start off with a third person view of your character, 
which they did specifically say they reduced in the final version of the game, but I feel like they shouldn't have done that. The only time I remember seeing my character in third person was at the very ending epilogue right before the credits. And of course, the game found a way to glitch out and it didn't even look like my character because they were just bald for no good reason. The reason I like the third person cutscene is because you have all this customization for your character, so you want to see them because you made them. Instead, it plays more like a traditional FPS game where there are very few situations where you actually get to appreciate the character that you designed. Cyberpunk is supposed to be an RPG with a really in-depth character creator, but it just makes the character creator feel weird and tacked on. Although to be fair, CD Projekt Red themselves no longer call it a RPG. They say it's an action adventure now. In a second, V is gonna do a takedown on a scavenger. The animation used for this takedown is much more complex than the final versions. This takedown specifically uses both the cooler and the gun in the animation. In the final version of the game, all the takedowns just use your hands no matter what weapon you have, and then it'll chain that into a much more basic animation where all they do is dump them into a container. In this upcoming fight, you can see how all of the enemies have their level and name above their heads. In the finalized version of the game, I couldn't even find a way to figure out what level an enemy actually is. So you never know exactly how easy or how difficult a fight is going to be. All we get to figure out the enemy level is a little icon above their head. And it's supposed to be if they have a skull above their head, they are really strong. Here is an ordinary but decently strong weapon I found in the game, and we're going to attack this person with the skull. So they should be much stronger than me, yet I could just still easily walk up to them, wail on them a few times, and I beat them without even getting hit. You see, they are much stronger than the people around them who I can actually one hit, which makes the skull basically useless on normal difficulty because I also have the exact opposite, where an enemy was so strong I could barely hurt them and they basically one hit me. My favorite part of the preview was this part, where we were getting shot through the wall. As the bullets went through the wall, the wall was falling apart at the same time, and at first I thought this whole section was completely removed from the game. Surprisingly, it's still there. You just won't get to see it if you listen to Jackie and try to do everything really stealthy. Getting to the point though, when I saw this I was really excited because I think, oh man, all these buildings, there are going to be so many walls to destroy, I bet you could do so many cool things with that. Well, that was the only full-sized wall that I found you could destroy. I even specifically went to a bunch of different buildings trying to find a wall that would crumble like this one and I could not find it. So what I did is I found the location that the first mission takes place on, and then I found the exact same wall that crumbled, and I was curious, would it fall apart in free roam as well? And the answer to that is yes, it will actually crumble apart perfectly fine in free roam mode. But again, this is the only wall that I could find that actually does this and even has some physics to it like if you break all the pieces that connect it to the rest of the wall it falls apart it reacts about what you'd expect it to do it's really really nice now you remember in the intro where you rescue the girl and there's another guy in the tub with her did you ever wonder what happened to him well he's still here actually in fact he's still in the bathtub but now he's standing up in it he still looks kind of banged up and i bet his feet are really cold still being in the water but overall he looks like he's gonna be healthy and has made a full recovery that is, of course, unless you try to scan him. If you try to scan him, apparently he's dead. But also, he's like a main character or something, so you can't actually shoot him even if you wanted to. And if you throw a grenade down, he reacts. Pretty spry for a dead guy. Now, I'm not going to actually show most of the scenes involving that lady because the titties are hanging out all over the place, but thankfully, nothing in there was really significantly changed. Again, after mission completion, it goes back to another scene where you can see your character. And the alternative in the final version of the game is you're just locked in the elevator and there's nothing to do anyways. So why not just go and make it into a cutscene? This is going to sound crazy, but I think there's a possibility some of the cutscenes were made to be used as loading screens. I know that sounds really, really weird, but take this scene for example. Where it starts off with you a little bit in the noon, but the radio's playing around in the background as you just kind of do everyday life before Jackie comes into contact with you. And then look at the load screens for the game. 
It's scenes from V's apartment with the radio playing in the background just like that scene. The only difference is this one isn't actually a fully 3D rendered environment. This one is just a 2D slideshow, which makes a lot more sense considering you don't want the load screens to take extra long because you're rendering a 3D environment at the same time. I just thought it was interesting that you could see the influence from the trailer in the load screens like that. Throwing in a small complaint here, they specifically mention what song is playing on the radio. Good morning, Night City. The song on the radio is by rocker boy Johnny Silver. But in game, if you have a radio playing in the car, or the radio on the table is playing a song, it's not going to tell you what the actual name of the song is. And on this gun that V picks up, there are a lot of stats on this gun that are not present in the guns that are actually in the game. It has a stat called PNT, which I'm assuming is Armor Penetration. Then it also has stats for Recoil, Spread, and Range. In the final version of the game, all you have is Damage and Rate of Fire, which gives you DPS. Some guns will mention these statistics and how it's slightly different than an ordinary one, but statistics like that seem to only really appear on the more rare weapons. Like this shotgun says the bullet spread is reduced after every shot by 80%. Thankfully, they also have additional damage stats. So this one has an increase in physical damage and an increase in bleeding chance. This one has an electrical damage increase. This one has chemical damage. It has a charge up to it with poison chance and it does additional damage on a headshot. So the guns themselves seems like there's more variety to them, but there's less variety in how they're actually used because I never really thought about, oh, I need a gun with this type of damage. I just said, give me the gun with the most damage. If they actually had things like spread and recoil built into the gun, I would be testing both of the guns out to figure out which one do I like better. So in the final game, the only stat I really paid attention to was the headshot multiplier because some of them do multiple times more damage on headshots. And then I would go to the attachments and make sure it has the best attachment I had at that time because that's where range seems to actually be determined is what attachment you use. The way things were phrased in the trailer, they made it sound like the look of the clothes is also going to be important because they were talking about street cred and how you got to have the street cred. But in reality, all they were talking about is you get 5% faster leveling with that jacket on. The more interesting thing here is it actually tells you what kind of damage this jacket resists and how much it resists that specific kind. And all those specific statistics for resisting different types of damage are just gone from clothes. Some clothes do have additional bonuses, like this one will increase your evasion, or this one will decrease the damage you receive over time. But again, just like the guns, all I really looked at was the actual armor because the extra bonuses never really seemed like they were big enough of a buff to make it worth having clothes with less armor. It was basically just a tiebreaker when I had two clothes that were very closely rated. Now, the most dramatic change, fat people go-karts are completely gone. Where are my fat people go-karts? I gotta calm down. How about we listen to one of the most ironic statements in the whole trailer? A big part of our RPG experience is having a world that is interactive. So why is this ironic? Because that is one of the biggest complaints I've seen about the game is the world just feels dead. Even though it looks beautiful, there's nothing to interact with. For example, they were showing an ad that'll dynamically change and show you where the vending machine is to go buy the thing in the ad. Not only is this feature not found in the final version of the game, the actual board that they show in the demonstration isn't even in the game because they were so ashamed that they had to remove that. I barely noticed this, but when you go into the elevator, there are four different buttons you can click to choose what level you are going to. In the final version of the game, there are only two buttons, ground floor and the one that's close to your apartment. So I was curious then, what happens if you try to go in between those levels? So I decided to try to find the safest way to get down an extra level. Thankfully, there's this nice little platform that you can land on. Then you can go from that platform to the level below you. Except when you do that, it just instant kills you. That's not fall damage. That's just instant death because they don't want you to go there. Here is the first time they show you walking inside of a crowd. Take note of the density of the crowd here and keep that in your mind as we walk through the exact same area with the crowd density at its maximum. But I have noticed where some of the areas where the crowd is really dense, there is a pretty noticeable drop in the frame rate, so that is definitely something they cut down on to increase performance. When they show you purchasing things from Victor, 
they actually show an interface that hovers above where you're sitting down. And I've always liked interfaces that do that, but I will fully admit the interface in the final version of the game is much easier to navigate. Kind of interestingly, the screens are still part of the cutscene, but the screen just displays a static image. The closest thing to something like this in the final version of the game is the buttons you click on the elevator. There are no other menus that are this tightly integrated inside of the game. This is huge, but it's also entirely speculation. It feels like the storyline with Jackie was significantly cut down from the final version of the game. There are scenes shown in the trailer that aren't present in the final version of the game, and these feel like small things that are part of the bigger picture of the friendship you have with Jackie. Like right now, he's talking about how he just got himself a fancy new set of wheels. But in the final version of the game, all he ever does is borrow our car. So it'd make a lot of sense if it starts off with he borrows our car, and then eventually we do a lot of jobs together, he gets some money, and then he gets his own set of wheels, and it looks nice. It's a lot nicer than our car. And it's funny, everybody online basically blames Keanu Reeves for this. Because it's either they wanted to have him in the game as early as possible, so they reduced them out with Jackie. Or, he was barely a real character, but then the developer's like, we got a real celebrity, and he wants to do more, so we're gonna make him the main character now. Like, there's no proof on either of those things, I just think it's funny that both of the reasons are basically, it's Keanu's fault. All we get is what feels like a super cut down, summarized version of this. Where it's just a bunch of random clips of you and Jackie doing cyberpunk things. And looking at these scenes, all I can think is, were these actually missions they originally had planned, but they had to cut? That's what I think of when I see this. Because the game's basically telling you, you and Jackie are great friends. Instead of actually letting you experience how you become friends, and then you get to meet his mother and talk to her and see what she's like. Instead of just seeing her for five seconds and thinking, wait, was that Jackie's mom? Furthermore, there's a quest that they show where you do it with Jackie by your side. In the final version of the game though, there's no way to do it with him. You always just end up doing it alone. There is so much potential to actually build up the relationship with Jackie instead of just saying, yep, you guys are friends now. And in a second, you'll get to see what the character menu looks like. There's nothing special about it I want to point out, but it does look different. And I'll let the trailer itself describe this next missing feature. The inspection system allows us to take a closer look at the splinter. You can inspect specific items to reveal details that can help in solving quests. So this is a pretty cool looking feature that's kind of in the game, but not exactly. Because shards are in the game. And if you get a shard from a mainline story and you use it, you get an aesthetic that looks really like that. It has the exact same look to it, but it's actually showing you information and not just the item you're inspecting. But not only is the ability to inspect items completely gone, all of the shards that you actually find around the level and pick up are going to be just basic text that you can read. Shards like this are only used for really big, important parts of the game. And right after we're done inspecting it, it tells you that the little robot dude can follow you. They did specifically state though that this feature was being cut from the game. Okay, let's equip the splint to our chipware slot. With this done, the bot will now follow us wherever we go. They also used this room to talk about how there are multiple ways to complete a mission. Ironically enough, the alternatives they mention in this preview aren't there in the final version of the game. It looks like there are several ways out of this room. Like those gates, for example. However, you'd have to be a skilled netrunner to hack into this terminal. So what does this level actually look like? Well, if we go to this control panel, we can't even interact with it. But the point was, is we want to open these doors, right? And we can open these doors if our strength is at 20. Now, 20 means your strength is completely maxed out. I finished the game at level 23, and this is the first real big mission, basically. So you're not going to have a level 20 strength unless you do some really stupid stuff, which I did. So I have level 20 strength, so I can open these doors. And what's on the other side of these doors? Basically a glitched environment. So they literally made those doors only openable by a level 20 character just as a way to soft lock you out of it. Because if you go out here, it's just glitched up. There should be enemies here because when we walk through, there were enemies around. But they're all gone because you're not supposed to be here and all that remains is the cameras. And if you try to go through the door you came in, it doesn't open at all. 
So no matter what, in this specific situation, you need to do the pass through the maintenance tunnel. Now, one thing that's kind of funny is you try to use the elevator to get back up and it doesn't work. So you have to do some crazy parkour nonsense to actually try to get back up to where you were before, which is just kind of dumb. But that's the only way to continue along the level. Also, when you open up that panel, it shows you need engineering of at least one to open it up. But the interesting thing is, is I never saw anything that used that kind of statistic to determine if you could do something or not. Because engineering is one of the passive skills that you level up just by doing engineering like things. All the skill checks I saw in the game used the skills that you level up by assigning points. And I'm talking a lot about things they removed, but they do warn you that they might do that. Heck, they say specifically this might not be in the final version of the game, and then hey, it isn't. Just a reminder, everything you've seen and are about to see, including this particular feature we're about to show you, is from a work in progress version of the game and may change over the course of development. Okay, all exits covered. Okay, let's try something different. We're going to take this guy down and connect directly to his neural sign. In the world of cyberpunk, once you are jacked into a network, you have access to everything it connects to. Through this Maelstrom gang method, we've now connected to the gang hideout's internal network. This is the building's personnel system. Let's focus on the squad containing the Maelstrom ganger we just connected to. From here, we can deploy software that affects the whole squad. For now, we'll simply unlock the ability to perform quick hacks. It is interesting though that they specifically mention doing that enables you to have quick hacks and normally you can just do quick hack basically whenever. It's not like you have to do any sort of complex setup like that. You just walk up to somebody like, hey, I'm going to hack that or that or that or that. I didn't have to jack in to get access to the quick hacks. And they also showed that you can do some wall running. Now this they did announce that they removed from the game because it just broke too many of the levels. But also that's probably a good thing because this seems so interesting. I'm pretty sure everybody would just have Mantis arms so they could do this kind of nonsense. Funnily enough though, even without wall running, you can easily turn the game into a cyberpunk version of Mirror's Edge. All you need to do is get the double jump augmentation. And then you can run in all the places you're not actually supposed to be. That is of course until you find a location that looks like it has collisions and then it doesn't so you end up going straight through it. Then you get to see the secrets behind the game like a true netrunner. Seriously now, what's more cyberpunk than this? And the last thing I want to mention is how they just really overpromise the most basic of things. Like they really make it sound like every decision you make is really gonna matter. But think back, what would have happened if we hadn't met with the Militech agent? Or told Royce about the agent and her plans? Or just decided to buy the bot ourselves? So many options, so many possibilities and each will have consequences that will ripple through the game world and your story. And that's just one quest. Now I could really get into a rant right here, but I'm going to keep it simple. They way oversell how important your choices are. Like it feels like you do have influence over how a single quest goes, but it doesn't really feel like it matters in the world outside of the quest. Anyways, that's going to do it for this video, and this is version 2 of the video that was improved thanks to comments from you guys, so thank you very much to everybody who helped out. So until next time, this has been YBR, and remember, if you like or dislike this video, I will know. I can tell by how deceptive the trailer is, so do the right thing, and I'll see you next time. And if you watched the video all the way to this point, let me give you my quick opinion on this. So I don't think the game is nearly as bad as so many people say it is. The problem is all of the media for the game overpromised on such a ridiculous level. There is no way they were going to achieve that. And if you were to ask me what I thought about it, it's the best game I've played all year. But that's not really saying much because if you look at my channel, you'll see I really don't play good games. And also I'll admit this now. Usually when I make a video, I make it for the viewers. This video, I made for me. And since you listen to me ramble, one more fun fact. The most iconic line in all of the advertising, wake the fuck up samurai, we've got a city to burn, did not make the cut. Everybody loved that line. How did it not make the final game?